The book of Esther. If you're not there, please turn there now. The book of Esther, chapter 1. For many students of the Bible, the book of Esther is somewhat of a puzzle. In fact, a number of the church fathers felt that Esther should not be included in the canon. That is, included in our Bibles. They felt that it lacked the credentials, it lacked the weight to be included in the Scriptures. Why, you say? Well, because in the book of Esther, there is no mention of God. In the book of Esther, there's no reference to worship or prayer or faith. In the book of Esther, there's no allusion to heaven or to hell. And from the book of Esther, no New Testament writer pulls a quotation. Because of that, it seems as though to some that Well, on the surface anyway, it's not a very religious book at all. An interesting story of history, but lacking spirituality. That's the way it may seem on the surface. Ah, but below the surface, behind the stage, we see the faithfulness of the Father, the providence, the provision, the protection of a loving, faithful father to his weak faith and somewhat backsliding children. Let me explain. In the year 606 BC, Nebuchadnezzar launched an invasion against the Jews and came against Jerusalem. He began carrying away the Jews into captivity, even as Jeremiah prophesied it would be. For 70 years, the Jews would be in that place of hostage, captivity in Babylon. And that's precisely what happened beginning in the year 606 B.C. The reason for their captivity, as we've talked about previously, is because, well, the Jews were falling into idolatry constantly. Turning their backs on the Lord and going after false gods. And they had ignored the sabbatical, the Sabbath year. For 490 years, they didn't keep a Sabbath year as they were supposed to. That is, they missed 70 Sabbath years in total. And so for those two reasons, their continual plunging into idolatry and immorality and their ignoring of the Sabbath years, you see, the Jewish people found themselves being carted off, carried away into captivity for 70 years, just like Jeremiah prophesied would happen. Now, after 70 years... In 536 B.C., Cyrus, the king of Persia, you see, the Persians had taken over the Babylonian Empire and now they were in power. And Cyrus, the king of Persia, just like Isaiah had prophesied 150 years before Cyrus was even born, Cyrus came to the throne and when he came to the throne, he gave a proclamation that declared that the Jews that were in captivity in Babylon, and now Persia was in charge of that empire, that region, you see, that the Jews could go back. They could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. Any that wished to, all that wanted to, could go back to Jerusalem, you see. And we've been talking through that story. You might recall how Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, They came on the scene and led a contingency of Jews from Babylon back to Jerusalem where they would engage in the rebuilding of the temple, the restoring of the nation. 
But what is intriguing is that there in that return from Babylon, as Cyrus gave permission, only about 50,000 Jews left Babylon to go back to Jerusalem. The same Jews that were carried away 70 years earlier with sorrow and sadness. In fact, this psalm was written at that time. Listen to this. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And here we see the lamentation, the sadness, the sorrow of the Jewish people and saying, Oh, how can we sing in this place, Babylon? We don't belong here. This isn't good for us. We long to be back in Jerusalem again. But the ironic thing is, is when they had the opportunity, after 70 years in captivity, when they could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple and restore their worship, only a fraction of the nation chose to go. There were perhaps 2 million Jews in Babylon at the time when Cyrus said, you can go home again. Of that number, perhaps as high as 2 million, only 50,000 chose to go. The rest, well, they had become quite comfortable in Babylon. They had built their homes, they had established their businesses, and things were going quite well for them, quite frankly. They were quite prosperous in that country. And they learned to sing the song of Babylon, if you would. They were in tune with what was taking place there, so much so that they didn't have that desire, the vast majority, to go back to Jerusalem to reestablish their nation. And so these were weak faith people. We could even say that perhaps they were in sort of a backslidden condition. They chose to stay in Babylon because of their prosperity, perhaps because of just lethargy, Whatever the case might be, they didn't take the invitation to go back and establish their own nation. And that is why, you see, we don't hear the name of God mentioned openly. We don't read about prayer ascending, you see, or faith, or these other things that are so frequently talked about and focused on in the other books of the Bible. Because these people were in sort of a weak faith, backslidden condition. But even though, gang, even though they were faithless, most of them should have made the journey back to Jerusalem. Some, no doubt, had reasons that would be acceptable, infirmity, age, but most of them should have taken advantage of the opportunity and made the journey. But they didn't. But even though they were not faithful, they were faithless, God is faithful. He's watching over His children. He's at work behind the scenes. He still cares about them passionately. He's committed to them unquestionably. And that's one of the reasons I love this book so much. Because there are times when I feel so faithless, so weak, I'm not the person I ought to be. I'm not as, I, as strong as I, as I should be. I know that's true. And yet, even when I am faithless, as Paul told Timothy, God is faithful still. He cannot deny himself. And that's one of the key components of this book of Esther. Why God is in the shadows, if you would, not talked about directly, in the shadows, backstage, but in control absolutely. Even when we are faithless, 
he is faithful still. He can't deny himself. And he is going to be, as we shall see, protecting his children, his weak faith children. Amazingly. Take heart. Take hope. You that feel as though you're unworthy, I've got news for you. You are. (laughs) You that aren't as strong as you think you should be, none of us are, you see. But God is faithful. Let's take a look at the story and watch it unfold, shall we? It came to pass, verse 1, in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. That in those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, He made a feast unto all his princes and his servants. The power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty. Many days, even 180. Ahasuerus, the man mentioned here, is in power. He's the king. That's not his name, Ahasuerus. It's a title. It means exalted father. The Ahasuerus being talked about here is a man named Xerxes. Xerxes. Interesting, because at this time in history, Xerxes is getting ready to launch an invasion of Greece and on into Europe. One of the decisive moments in Western history, in world history, is about to take place when Xerxes, the Ahasuerus here, the Ahasuerus in our story, mobilizes two million men. That's a great big army. And he gets this massive army together to make his way to invade Greece. He invades Thermopylae. In hundreds of ships, in an incredible naval battle, Xerxes launches this invasion. He was successful in the invasion, but it took a great toll on his army, virtually destroyed much of his navy. As he continued on into that area of Greece, there at Salamis, he was stopped and a great upset took place. And the Persians were beaten back. And had he won that battle, had his invasion been successful completely, world history would be very different than it is. That was one of the most decisive moments in military history. Xerxes being beaten back. Well, in our story, he's about ready to launch that invasion. And that is probably the reason why he calls all of these leaders to come together. He's building a coalition. 180 leaders come together from all over the empire. He's seeking to gain their support to get them involved in this massive invasion he's about to make. But he's also showing off his wealth, his power lest any of them have a thought that, hey, while Xerxes is away, this is our opportunity to rebel or to make a move against his empire. He's letting them know how powerful, how wealthy he really is. He's letting them see the splendor and magnificence and glory of his empire. He is seeking to get them on his side, to keep him, to keep them close to make sure they don't splinter off or break away, to warn them that if they try anything, they're going to be crushed, you see. Well, it's at this point in history, Xerxes, you see, has this party that goes on for 180 days, day after day after day. The food, continual. The wine flows constantly. And during this time, when the days were expired, the king, verse 5, made a feast for all the people that were present in Shushan, in present-day Iran, in the palace, both great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. 
The place was decked out incredibly. There were white, green, blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings on pillars of marble. And the beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black and marble. And they gave them, verse 7, drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another. This is quite a party. Everybody had golden cups and the cups were each one uniquely made, artistically done. And the royal wine was in abundance according to the state of the king. The king was in a state of generosity. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Plenty to drink, but none were required to participate. All could if they chose, but none were commanded to. Sad to say in our day, in our culture, I was talking to some guys that said at a party they were at for the company because they didn't drink. They were really put down. But they took a stand anyway. And I said, good for you. God will bless you. Guarantee. Well, one of the guys said I got fired. (laughs) But then he came back and said, but man... I applied for another job and I'm making now twice as much money as I made previously. That's great. But this king in those days said, you can drink, but he wasn't forcing men to. Now Vashti also, verse 9 tells me and you, she, the queen, had a feast for the women in the royal house. She had her own party going for the women that had made their way to this incredible Party On the seventh day, verse 10, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass. He was kind of dead at that time. <laughs> the seven chamber lades that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the prince is her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. Indeed, her name Vashti, this queen, it means just that, beauty. She was fair to look upon. But the queen Vashti, verse 12, she refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. She didn't want to go to the party where the men were gathering and partying and drinking. She knew that the purpose of her being brought in was simply for the men to look at her, perhaps lust after her. She knew that those men were in sort of a drunken condition, many of them, and she refused the king's commandment when the king called for her to show her off to those that were at this royal party, you see. She refused to come. Well, the king, verse 12, wasn't pleased with this at all. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. He was ticked off, he was upset. He couldn't believe that she, Vashti, had the audacity to say no to his command to come into the party where the men might look at her and look on her. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times. For so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. He calls for the wise guys, his his lawyers, if you would, that knew the situations and the rules and the regulations. And these guys came, and they were before the king and listed there in verse 14. What shall we do unto Queen Vashti according to the law, he asks these wise men, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king king by the chamberlain. She didn't come when the king commanded her to. Well, Mimukin answered, verse 16, before the king and the princes, saying, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes, 
to all the people that are in all the provinces of Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall all the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. So, verse 19, If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him. Let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. Hmm. And the saying pleased the king. As Pastor Chuck pointed out today in this morning's study, this was the beginning sort of a women's liberation. When Vashti said, I'm not going to go before the king. Well, now what are we going to do? They protested. If this gets out, that she got away with that, all of our wives are going to be in that state of rebellion. And they didn't like that a bit. I was talking to a guy named Robert, who said he picked up his third grader from school. And his third grader, when he was picked up from school, said, Daddy, I got a part in the play. And Robert said, well, what part is that? I got the part of a a man that's been married 25 years. And Robert said, well, keep up the good work and maybe they'll give you a speaking part. (laughs) What's going to happen? They were saying protestingly. What's going to happen if this gets out? And so the advice was to the king that day, take away her crown. Take her out of the place of power. Let a new queen be found. The saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to this advice. He sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Put the news out. Get the word out that this kind of activity is not going to be tolerated, you see. That she would lose her place as queen because of her unwillingness to obey the command of the king. Well, in chapter 2, the story continues. Some time has passed, probably around three years. During that interval, Xerxes, as we talked about, Ahasuerus, his title, like Caesar or emperor, made his invasion of Greece, and as we mentioned, it was unsuccessful. He comes back a battered, beaten man. And now at this time, As he's sort of licking his wounds, he begins to feel evidently a bit lonely. Obviously, he would be somewhat depressed. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done, what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered to him, seeing that he was no doubt lovesick or lonely or sad or whatever it might be, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women under the custody of Higi, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women. Now Higi is also called Higai later on, as we'll see in the story. And his job was to be the keeper of the women the keeper of the harem. Now, some guys might say, that's not a bad job, to be the keeper of the women, to be in charge of the harem. Some might say, I'd apply for that. But you have to understand that in these times, in those days, 
when there was a guy that was assigned to be keeper of the harem, he was dealt with in such a way that he would never have a desire to touch a woman. So before you apply for that job, you might want to think it through a little more carefully. These guys became eunuchs uh, before they could be given that particular responsibility. So he was one of them, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. Let the maiden, verse 4, which pleased the king, be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king, and so did he. There's going to be a big beauty contest to find a new queen. Remember that show, Queen for a Day, back in the 50s, if you're my age? This is kind of like that, only it's queen not for a day. It's to be queen of the empire, sitting next to the king day after day, you see. So now there's going to be this search for a queen. A pageant is about to take place. In Shushan, verse 5 says, There was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. He had been carried away, verse 6, from Jerusalem, or his family had been carried away during the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar and carried off into Babylon. He, verse 7, this Mordecai, brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter or his cousin. Esther's name was originally Hadassah. That was her given name, which means myrtle. It was a bush. It was not a name that really was worthy of her in the eyes of many. And so she was renamed Esther, which means star. Because that's exactly what she is, as we shall see. So Hadassah was her given name, but it was changed to Esther. And she was being raised by her older cousin. She had neither father nor mother. And this Esther, she was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother died, took her for his own daughter. So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, when many maidens were gathered together to Shushan the palace, to the custody of Hegai, that Esther was brought also under the king's house to the custody of Hegai, keeper of the women. Searching for all the beautiful ladies throughout the region, of course, Esther was brought in and given over to Hegai, the keeper of the women. Josephus, in his writings, says that Mordecai initially tried to hide her. That's according to Jewish tradition and Jewish legend. That he didn't want his daughter, so to speak, his cousin that he was raising as his own, to be polluted in this way. And so he tried to hide her. And yet, her beauty was legendary. Everybody in the whole region knew about her. And so she could not be hidden. Whether that be so or not, we can't say for sure. But this we do know, she was spotted And she was brought into this pageant that was about to take place. The maiden pleased Hegai, verse 9 says. Esther pleased him. And again we see now the beginning of, of God's working. She finds favor in the eyes of the guy who's in charge of these beauties, these women. She obtained kindness from him. He speedily gave her things for purification with such things as belonged to her. And seven maidens, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. So he gave her what she needed and provided servant girls to assist her in this time of preparation. He preferred her and her maids under the best place of the house. Gave her the best room, if you would. Esther, verse 10, had not showed her people nor her kindred. She didn't let anyone know that she was a Jewess, you see. For Mordecai, verse 10, had charged her that she should not let this be known. She kept silent about her heritage, about her racial pedigree. Because there was already a great degree of anti-Semitism 
throughout the empire, around the world actually. And Mordecai warned her, <clears throat> don't make this known. It'll cause unnecessary problems or difficulties. Just keep it a secret, you see. So she did just that. And Mordecai himself, verse 11, walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. So he makes his way day by day in front of that house where Esther was to find out what he could to see what he might about how she was doing in this situation now verse 12 when every maid's turn was come to go into the king Ahasuerus after that she had been 12 months according to the manner of women for so were the days of their purifications accomplished to wit six months with oil of myrrh six months with sweet odors and other things for the purifying of women then thus came every maid unto the king. Interesting. Here she is now. She's in this house with other women. She has favor in the eyes of Hegai, the eunuch that oversees this group of ladies. And she spends the next 12 months preparing. 12 months soaking in myrrh and soaking in sweet oils and perfumes. Twelve months preparing for the day when she would be brought before the king. Amazing. Guys, you think your wife takes a long time getting ready. I mean, we're talking about a year of preparation here. <laughs> and she's soaked in myrrh for six months. And then she's soaked in sweet odors or sweet perfumes. Interesting. Interesting. She did this all for one person, for the king. She spent all of this time in preparation for one person. Spent all of this time soaking in myrrh and in sweet odors to make an impression on her king. Myrrh. Myrrh was used as a embalming perfume it speaks of death in the Bible myrrh one of the gifts that was brought to Jesus by the wise men who made their way to Bethlehem speaking prophetically of the fact that he would be one who would die according to God's grand plan you see myrrh releasing its fragrance when it's crushed Myrrh, an embalming perfume. And then after that came the sweet spices. I point this out to you to simply say this. Are we also those that say, Lord, you're the king. And you have been so good to me. And Lord, I want to please you. I want to soak and be perfumed in the fragrance of my own death. The death of my thing, the death of my flesh, the death of myself. Lord, when I come into your presence, I want to be pleasing unto you. I'm not spending this time, Lord, this morning in my devotions or this evening in my night watch. I'm not spending this time to make an impact on others primarily. But just because, Lord, you're my king. And I want to soak in that which would be pleasing in your sight. A sweet smelling savor to you. interesting because I'm often wondering Lord how many of us truly say that that is first and foremost our passion our priority is just to pleasure you not Lord to do this to get something from you 
or to do that to be used by you. But simply to say, Lord, I'm doing this just for you. Ministering to you, Lord. Letting go of my self and my sin. Letting it just die, Lord. You see, in the Old Testament, when God established the tabernacle, a place for worshiping Him, a place to fellowship with Him, I'm sure when He gave Moses the dimensions, the whole thing, 150 feet by 75 feet, that includes the courtyard, I'm sure Moses must have thought, wait a second, I'm not hearing you right. 150 feet by 75 feet? Lord, there's three million of us in this congregation. 150 feet by 75 feet, Lord. We're not going to fit. You must mean 150 miles by 75 miles. No, Moses, that's enough. At any given time, not that many are going to make their way to the tabernacle courtyards to just worship me. Fellowship with me. Not that many. The most important ministry of all is our ministry to the Lord. And it's one that you all can do, that I can do, that we can do. To say, Lord, I just want to be pleasing to you. I want to be a sweet-smelling savor to you. You're my king. You're my everything. Lord, I want to please you. He's pleased. The sweet-smelling savor Well, Leviticus over and over and over talks about the sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of our God is what? The burning of the flesh on the altar. Specifically, Leviticus 17 talks about the burning of the fat. When your flesh is burned, when the fat is sizzling, God says, that's a sweet-smelling savor to me. What's sweet-smelling to the Lord? When my flesh, myself, my ambitions, my desires that are ungodly or unchristlike. You see, all that stuff is just put on the altar and I say, Lord, I just want to see it just taken away. I let it go. I lay it down. I give it up. The Lord goes, ah, burning flesh. I like that. Sizzling fat. I was asked today at the door after second service, one couple asked me, well, tell me, You've been here now for eight weeks or whatever. Tell me, have you made a verdict yet on what I said? On in and out versus McDonald's. And I, I, <laughs> I said, well, you know, when I first got down here, I was extremely drawn to in and out. And, and I, it's a fine burger, no doubt. Great burger. But of late, I found myself wandering back for a Big Mac. There's something that's just disgustingly greasy and, and, and fat. You know, it's just, it's just kind of junky, or unbeatable. The, the Big Mac, the quarter pounder with just its grease dripping out. You know, it just kind of slides down and all that. God says, I love the fat. Why? We might say, wait a minute, Lord. The fat is what I like. In a steak, I like lots of fat, you know, marbled in. Or, or a Big Mac, or a quarter pounder with cheese, or whatever. Lord, I like the fat. The Lord says, ah, oh, no, give the fat to me. The fat is not to be consumed. It's to be burned. Now, as the years go by, as the centuries pass, we discover, Lord, that's why you wanted the fat. Because it's bad for us. It clogs up arteries, causes heart attacks and strokes and obesity and all the rest. Oh, Lord, you wanted that which would be harmful for me. I might not have understood that when I first heard you say in your word or in my heart, stay away from that. Don't go there. Don't get involved with this. I might say, oh, but Lord. And the Lord would say, let it go. Lay it down. Give it up. Die to yourself. And it will be a sweet-smelling savor to me. Really, Lord? And then I discover, wow, 
No wonder, Lord, you wanted that on the altar. No wonder that sizzling brought delight to you because you knew that it would bring pain to me. Lord, myrrh, the crushing, the death. That is what is a sweet-smelling savor to you. When I die to self, my ambition, my thoughts, myself. Lord, that's what I want to do. And then the sweet-smelling ointments after that were applied for another six months, you see. And now, after that kind of preparation, soaking in myrrh, the fragrance of death, of crushing, and the sweet-smelling savor that that would be, and then the spices that would follow, sweet odors, she now comes to the king. And she was given whatever she desired to take to the king, any clothes or accessories, whatever she wanted, she could take out with her to go and meet the king. In the evening she went, verse 14, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women. She came back again. That was the plan. She came in, verse 14 goes on to say, unto the king no more except the king delighted in her and that she was called by name. So a woman, after preparing herself, would go into the king and then she would go back again unless the king called her by name. Now it's time for Esther, verse 15. And she makes her way to the king. She obtained, verse 15, last phrase tells you and me, favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. Everybody that saw her come from her time of preparation was blown away by her beauty, you see. So she was taken into the king's house in the tenth month, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. She obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the other virgins. The king looks at her, is blown away by her, and places the crown. He set the royal crown upon her and made her queen instead of Vashti. He sees her, falls in love with her, and right there makes his decision that she is the queen. As Bert Parks sings, here she comes, Miss Medio Persia, or whatever it is. The other contestants are happy, I guess, but not really. She was chosen, you see, in this beauty pageant. She wins the prize, you see. And the king then makes a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, in honor of his new queen. He made a release to the provinces. That is, he gave them a tax break. He released them from their tax burden for that uh, time as a tax holiday. He gave gifts according to the state of the king, feeling generous, you see. He was giving out gifts and releasing people from their burden of taxation. Verse 19, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not yet showed her kindred or her people, that is her pedigree, her heritage, as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. At this time, the king calls for the women, a second bevy of beauties to come his way. Not to find a new queen, mind you, but just because he was kind of a carnal guy. And he brought some more women into his palace for that season. But Mordecai, at this point, is now, we see, in the king's gate, verse 21 tells you and me. That is, he's in a position of authority. Being the the father, if you would, of Esther, the one that raised her after her real parents died, he is now given a place of responsibility. He sits in the king's gate where leaders would sit. And while he was there, the plot thickens. Two of the king's chamberlains, Big Than and Tirish, of whose which kept the door, were angry, wroth, and sought to lay hand on King Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen. These guys were plotting to assassinate Ahasuerus, to do him in, to wipe him out. And Mordecai heard their plot, their plan. And he told Esther, 
about what he heard. And Esther certified the king thereof, or warned the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when, verse 23, inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out, therefore, these guys, these conspirators, these would-be assassins, were hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. So, Mordecai just happened to be in the right place at the right time to hear about this plot, this plan. And now the story is recorded in a book which will figure into the story as we shall see. After these things, chapter 3, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamaditha, the Agagite, and Ahasuerus advanced him and set his seat or his throne above all the princes that were with him. Now here comes Haman, the bad guy, the villain in the story. Haman is the Hitler of the Old Testament. He hates the Jews, as we shall see. He desires, determines to destroy them, if at all possible. Haman. But did you notice this? It says here that he was an Agagite. Now, thereon hangs a tail. The Agagites. Perhaps that name rings a bell. You might recall, way back in the days of Saul, that King Saul was told by the Lord, through the prophet Samuel, to destroy all of the Amalekites. Wipe them out. The Amalekites, which had been such a thorn in the flesh to the Israelites. The Amalekites, who we are told when Israel was on their way from Egypt to the land of promise. The Amalekites would attack sneakily, treacherously, the back of the pack. Where the weak were, or the nursing mothers, or the little kids, or the older folks might be, the back of this group that was making their way across the wilderness to the land of promise the Amalekites would attack the back. They were terrorists, if you would. They were descendants of Esau. They were, if you would, a picture, a type, an illustration of the flesh. What the flesh does. How the flesh works. Tries to get us in the back, the back of the pack, on the edges. And there he makes his attack. Well, Samuel came and told Saul, destroy all of them, every single one. And Saul went his way into battle against the Amalekites. And he came back from the battle. And Saul came out to meet him. And Saul said, ah, oh, blessed be the Lord, Samuel. Hey, we've done well. God has given us victory and all the rest, you see. Samuel said, well then, why do I hear this baying, this bleeding of the sheep? I told you that all the Amalekites and all of the animals of the Amalekites were to be destroyed. So why do I hear these sheep? This is not good. This is bad. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> well, Saul said, I saved the, the best sheep to give as an offering to the Lord. You see, Samuel no doubt shook his head. What? The Lord said, destroy everything. All of them and their animals too. And, and you didn't do that. And, and who's this? As he pointed to a man that was there, perhaps in chains. Oh, well, this is an Amalekite Agag. He's, he's, he's the king. I brought him back as a trophy. Ah, you ought not to have done this, Saul. You've disobeyed the Lord. The Lord desires obedience, not sacrifice. And Samuel took a sword and chopped up Agag right there, right then. Interesting. Because, you see, Saul made a big goof, a real gaffe. He didn't deal with 
the Amalekites, the flesh, the king, Agag, personally, in the way he should have. He thought he could keep it under control. I've got Agag under control. I've got him chained up. It's not going to be a problem. Oh my. But then, years later, we see Saul on Mount Gilboa. He's been wounded. He has been wounded terribly. He tries to take his own life, evidently unsuccessfully. And as he lies there, he looks up and leaning over him is a man who is about to do him in. Who are you? I am an Amalekite. And he killed Saul. See, because Saul didn't kill the Amalekites, the Amalekite killed him. That's the way it always is. The Lord says to you, the Lord tells me, deal with this. Get rid of that. And if I don't, if you won't, the fact of the matter is, that will rise up and do us in. And take us down. You can't mess with this stuff. And now, Agag, you see, because he wasn't dealt with, because the Amalekites weren't wiped out when they should have been by Saul. Well, Saul was done in by an Amalekite. And now they're still around. At this time in our story, they're still around, the Agagites. And now it's not just one man that's in danger like Saul was in. It's the whole nation that this man Haman, a descendant of Agag, is seeking to wipe out, to destroy all of the Jewish people, you see. Good lesson for me. Important lesson for us. I have to deal with the stuff that God tells me to deal with. Not only is it sweet smelling in his nostrils, because he knows when I do that, when I deal with the flesh, it's going to be beneficial to me. But if I don't deal with it, the story here in chapter 3 is it will come back and haunt you and haunt me, guarantee. So Haman comes on the scene. All the king's servants in the king's gate bowed down and reverenced this man. They, they gave honor to him, for the king had commanded this. But Mordecai did not bow down. He wouldn't reverence him. The idea is he wouldn't worship him as others were commanded to, or others did, you see. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel, Mordecai would not do that. Wouldn't pay homage in that way. Worshipping Haman. Worshipping Ahasuerus. Wouldn't go there. Wouldn't do that. The king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Don't you know what the king has commanded? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them he was a Jew. Evidently, Mordecai said, I'm not going to bow down and pay reverence to this man or to any man because only one is worthy of worship. And I won't bow down to any man in that way. I'm a Jew, you see. He let them know who he was, where he was from. When Haman, verse 5, saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, he was full of wrath. He sought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai. Wanted to lay hands on him, and that's not for healing, folks. For they showed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, all the people of Mordecai. So in the first month, verse 7, that is the month of Nisan, April, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast poor, or that is rolled dice, they cast lots before Haman from day to day, from month to month, to the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar or March. What's happening is there? He's now casting dice, if you would, poor, casting lots to find the right time. He was a superstitious man. He was casting lots, rolling dice to find the right time by which he might launch his diabolical plan. Destroying, you see, the Jewish people, Mordecai and all the Jews 
destroy him utterly. So he casts lots, he rolls the dice, and now it comes up that it's to be on the month of Adar, which gives them just about a year, you see. Right here, the first month of Nisan, verse 7, April, and it's not going to come about this day of destruction until March, you see. So it gives them just about a year. God is once again behind the scenes controlling everything. Haman, verse 8, said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. These people have a different set of laws. They're not obeying you. They're out of sync with everybody else in your kingdom, you see. So if it please the king, verse 9, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver or approximately $30 million. Haman says, these people are not like others in your kingdom. And if it please you, I will destroy them and I will pay you $30 million in today's economy. Now, how would Haman get that kind of money? Well, obviously, from the Jews that he would have destroyed. Which goes to prove that these Jews were successful there in the Persian Empire in Babylon. And that causes jealousy and envy. It's been a problem for the Jews wherever they go. They've prospered unbelievably. They followed the principles of God's Word, even though many don't believe in God or walk with God. Yet there are principles in play that have been embraced by the Jewish people that causes them to prosper in most remarkable ways. Did you realize that the Jewish people, less than one-tenth of one percent of the population on our planet, have won 26% of all Nobel Prizes? 26% of all, over one in four of all Nobel Prizes given out, given away, has been won by a Jew. Their population, less than one-tenth of one percent of the world's population. What's with that? Why have they prospered intellectually and financially and in so many arenas? I believe it's because... There are principles in play embedded in the culture from the Word that have allowed them to excel and to succeed. God's principles work. And these people show that fact. In fact, Count von Zinzendorf was asked one time by a king that he was standing before, give us proof that the Bible is true. And he said, I'll give you one word. The Jew. God's hand has been on them. He's cared for them. He's worked in them, through them. He has a plan ahead of them. It's true. The preservation of the Jew is remarkable. And the prosperity of the Jew is undeniable. And here Haman says, I'm going to give you 30 million bucks if if we go and destroy these people that seem to be so out of sorts with your laws and your ways, king, you see. So, after making this proposal, the king took his ring, verse 10, from his hand, and gave it to Haman. And the king said, verse 11, the silver is given to thee, keep your money. The people also do to them as it seems good to you. Hey, you don't have to pay me. Just go ahead and do what you want to. Haman's plan was accepted by the king to destroy the Jewish people there in that region. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month. And there was written according to all that Haman had commanded the king to the governors and all those that were in charge in every province, in every language. Letters, verse 13, were sent by post to all the king's provinces to destroy, kill, and cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Destroy them, and then rob them. The copy 
of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready for that day. Get ready for that day, that predetermined day there in March where there will be a holocaust, an annihilation, a complete, total, devastating destruction of the Jewish people. And these posts, these Messengers went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. They had a drink together. This king, Ahasuerus, and Haman, this hellish henchman, they drank together. But the city of Shushan was perplexed. What's happening in our city? What's going on? The destruction of a people? How can this be? But you see, God has already set the stage. God's plan is unfolding, as you're well aware of. Esther is in place. She's been chosen to be the queen. And she will have a huge role to play, as we shall see. And what I want to leave you with tonight is simply this. Please listen. Things look bleak. The people are perplexed. The city is stunned. Folks can't figure out what's going on. The Jewish people, no doubt, are terrorized as the word gets out. But these that were weak-faithed, these that didn't go when they had the opportunity with Zerubbabel and Joshua to make their journey to Jerusalem. They missed the opportunity. They didn't respond as perhaps they should have, you see. And no doubt now they're saying, they're thinking, they're feeling, oh my, we're doomed. We're destined for destruction. The word goes out. Things look bleak. There's confusion. But God is on the throne. And He has compassion on all of His children. No, they're not going to hear prophets raised up like the ones in Jerusalem did. They're not going to celebrate the feasts like the ones in Jerusalem would. They're not going to experience the glory and the joy like the ones in Jerusalem would, you see, as we saw in the book of Ezra. But even though they're going to miss out on that, God is not going to turn His back on those weak-faithed children. He's faithful. John, why are you saying this? I believe it's the word of the Lord for tonight. I really do. I believe that too many of us worry and we are full of anxieties. We say, oh my, I, I, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. I, I, God is no doubt angry with me, no doubt He's given up on me, no doubt. Oh, I'm going to be destroyed. If we could just understand the faithfulness of our Father to all of His children, to all of us who have opened up our hearts to receive Jesus Christ, who have been born again, who have been adopted into His family, who are part of His kingdom, He is faithful to us, not just when we're doing good, but in the days when we're not doing what we should. He is faithful still. Oh, we might miss out in our backslidden condition, in our weak faith times. We might miss out on celebrations and prophecy and blessings, no doubt. But God will be faithful. He's going to see us through. Guarantee. He's there behind the scenes. He's there backstage orchestrating everything. Huh. When I was at Biola 
my freshman year, I was pledging to be a part of a fraternity group. And they have this thing that they do in fraternities called hazing. In order to join, you have to go through a bunch of stuff. And I had to go through a bunch of stuff. You know, all of us pledges did. We had to walk around for a whole week with, with eggs in all of our pockets. And whenever one of the fraternity guys came by, he had the right to smash the eggs in our pockets. And it would just kind of, you know, just run down your shirt and all over the place. It was a big mess. The yoke was on me, you see. <laughs> we had to walk around all that week and carry a cardboard box and have a broom in our hand. And whenever one of the actives, one of the fraternity guys would yell, air raid, we had to get in the box and shoot down imaginary airplanes, you know, in class or, or whatever, wherever we were. We had to eat goldfish and all sorts of other things, and they took us to La Mirada. We had to go out to a dairy and actually dig our way through a huge mound of, of cow manure and, and make our way. It was just awful, just terrible, just all kinds of stuff. But we got them back. That's a story for another lesson. But all this stuff you had to do, I, I recall hearing about one fraternity prank in Kansas. It scared the guy to death because, you see, they took that pledge and they dropped him down a well. And he was there being dropped down lower and lower, several hundred feet. And he was in that well. It was pitch black. And they had him there holding on to the end of the rope. There was a big knot on the end of the rope and he was holding on for dear life. And he said, come on, guys. Okay, let me up. Pull me up. Come on now. Get me out of here. But there was no answer. The guys, you see, had tied the other end, the top end of the rope, to the wooden bar that went across the top of the well. And they just left him there. And he was hanging and holding on. His arms were aching. His muscles were burning. His forehead was sweating. And he was screaming. Screaming out, come on, guys, get me out, pull me up. He was pitch black down there. And finally, after 15, 16, 17 minutes, his muscles were aching so bad, he, he knew he couldn't hold on much longer and let go. And when he let go, he dropped one inch. <laughs> These guys had measured perfectly the depth of that well and figured out exactly how tall he was, where his hands would be. When they lowered him down, you see, they knew that he'd be just about an inch or two above the ground. He couldn't see it. It was pitch black. And ultimately, when he let go, he would drop only about an inch or so. And he dropped. Interesting, because I think sometimes we strain and struggle. We sweat. We cry. Oh, no, I can't hang on. I'm not going to make it. God would say, I've got you. I'm in control. I'm here. I know your frailty. I know your frame that you are dust. I understand. And when you're faltering and lacking faith, and perhaps you're not in Jerusalem where you should be, but I will never turn my back on you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be at work providing and protecting in ways that, well, you'll see. It'll blow your mind, warm your heart. And God would have some here tonight to know that He is on the throne. He's in control. You're struggling and straining and worried about your son or your daughter or that neighbor or your father or mother who, who's not walking like they ought to. God loves them. And they'll go through chastening because He loves them so passionately. But He's not giving up on them. And He's not giving up on you and He hasn't given up on me. God is in control. He's on the throne. Even during those times when we can't see or when we don't feel worthy. 
And we shall see in our study next time the faithfulness of God breaking through and how good God is to these Jews there in Babylon and how good He is to me and to you here in Orange County too. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I do thank You tonight that even when we are faithless, that You are faithful. That Your promise to me and Your promise to us is that You would never leave us nor forsake us. I know, Father, a bunch of us tonight are aware of our shortcomings, our inconsistencies, our problems. But Lord, tonight we come into this sanctuary and find just that sanctuary that you care for your children. That you work all things together for good to those who are the called. And Lord, we have been called by you. And may every person who is in this place know tonight that you are the God of inexhaustible grace, full of mercy, made known day by day. Father, we don't want to miss out. We want to be smack dab in the center of your will. Father, keep us from wandering away. We don't want to get beat up unnecessarily. Keep us in your will. Cause us to be obedient. Make me and make us people that want to pleasure you with the death of our flesh and self. And to be free of the agags that would do us in ultimately. But Lord, during those times and in those days, when we're aware of our failings, this I pray, you would remind us, even through this story, of your goodness and greatness and faithfulness. And may these your people be strong in their faith in you and passionate in their love for you. And this I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.